So champions, I'm in a better mood today. <laughs> we got approval on this Pro Junior 3, and uh, we're going to go ahead. He got uh, gave us approval for the Works Burger, so we're going to make it a little bit more reliable in the long term. So follow us along for the ride, or go and watch cat videos. I don't really give a shit. Now the owner really likes this little amp, um, and he likes using uh, different preamps into different power amps, having a bit of a play in the studio. So he inquired if I could put a preamp output. Uh, somewhere next to the speaker jack. That's a possibility. I'll have a look at the schematic and see how easy that will be. He said if it's too much trouble, don't worry about it. If it's more than like, I don't know, 50 bucks or something. Um, but it could be just a matter of running some coax to uh, a jack, a normal jack, and then running the coax back or a possibly a twin core cable um, that runs from the tip to the shorting jack um, or a switch or something, I don't know. We'll figure it out. I may as well recap it because these things suck. Um, well, we've got the board out. I'm gonna up the screen grid resistance. I'm gonna lower the bias a little bit, not too far. Otherwise the plate voltage will go through the roof and that's already seeing at 340, I think it was. And uh, hopefully, oh, the, the ringing EL84 will replace yeah. that with a new match pair. That's vaporized the riding off it. So they've gotten way too hot. And uh, once the new valves are in there, hopefully with that bias point, they'll be a little bit happier for a longer term rather than cooking themselves like this thing. We'll also probably replace this, this little jack down here, which is a known weakness. Uh, since he'll be plugging stuff in and swapping stuff all the time, if he keeps unplugging that speaker jack, it'll probably break within that rubber boot, which uh, the plastic boot there, which which happens quite often. So uh, we'll sort that out. And as I say, just go over the thing and just check it all. So we'll do that as well, like we always do. And first thing though, I'll uh, test this speaker. It is running at the moment, so I'll turn it up a bit and have a listen, just make sure everything's behaving itself. Just so if there's anything else we need to look at while, while the board's out, we can assess it um, during that time. Oh fuck, I need more coffee, oh, I can't think. Now the single biggest upgrade you can do to pretty much any Fender amp is replacing the shitty stock Eminence driver. Eminence make good stuff, or IC make good stuff. Um, a lot of these brands make good stuff, but Fender doesn't use their good stuff. Fender makes them make the cheapest shit they can possibly make in order to keep these under a certain price point, um, which is fair enough. Uh, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So replacing those drivers uh, can be a pretty pretty significant difference. These tend to sound pretty boxy, not a lot of bottom end, not a lot of top end, they're sort of real low mid oriented. Um, I don't personally like Jensen at the moment. I don't think they've made a good speaker for the last 10 years. Um, but putting a WGS or something in there would be great. Um, uh, some any celestian um there's so much available even some of the other eminent stuff the legend series is great uh these these are just like the lowest of the low that um eminence make you can get oem quotes from eminence to make batch runs of speakers and you can specify everything um i don't think fender specified much other than the price point <laughs> so that's how you end up with a driver like that now you can see on the control panel here, that's rust under the surface. It's going to break through one day and you're going to lose all the writing. Uh, so that's a bit of a shame. It's probably been kept in a pretty high humidity area. So we'll be careful not to remove that for the moment. And if, well, not if, but when it happens in the future, there may be on eBay or the usual suspects, um, I've seen control panel replacement vinyl overlays uh, so you could scrape that back and um, treat it with something to neutralize the rust and then put the sticky shit on the face of it and put all the hardware back on um, but at the moment it's intact so we'll leave it as is so let's have a quick listen to this thing see what it sounds like if there's any uh, underlying issues or problems with the speaker it's already a little bit of hum there just because the chassis is so tiny and the output transformer is probably close to the power. Oh yeah. That's really crap. 
correctly. Oh, you can hear the... Someone asked recently about the uh, Zellweger tones that we have here for off-peak water heating. If you listen carefully, it won't happen because I'm trying to show it. There it is. And then it stops. See that? And it'll go again. There it is. So that's telling our meters in the meter box um, when to start a random interval timer and then switch on the hot water. So the idea behind that is that it uses power during off-peak, so uh, when people aren't at home with their heater on watching TV, it kicks in when everyone's going to work. Uh, so there's not a massive load on the power grid. And also, if all of those heaters turn on at once, it'll be a massive inrush because all their, all their elements are cold. Uh, and you blow up transformers and overload everything. So they want to start around that time, but they want to have an even sort of bell curve of the uh, the power usage so it starts the timer every time it's got a random interval between I don't know what it is like maybe up to half an hour or an hour or something and then they all start slowly turning on random intervals um, and then that evenly distributes the inrush current to all of the, the heating elements and uses the power during a time when there's not a high power demand otherwise so there you go, Zellweger tones. It's a 1050, I believe it's 1050 hertz sine wave, superimposed on the 50 hertz uh, normal mains sine wave, right? Uh, if you do some nice filtering in your mains input, you can get rid of that pretty well, like the EMI line filters get rid of it, but uh, Fender, so it's only a concern in Australia and I think some areas in New Zealand still so why would they bother installing it so you can hear there's quite a bit of hum that's with the volume all the way down the output ripple is probably affecting it I don't, I don't think that's the caps going more than it's the excess current draw on the power supply that can't handle it so the, the poor little caps are trying to supply those those outputs with uh, a good 30 watts or so and they should be doing about you know half of that so once we bring that quiescent current draw down, uh, we'll have less ripple and there'll probably be less hum as a result. So to do all this shit, we're gonna have to remove this chassis. So let's disconnect it, <coughs> shall we? Take the valves out again and this stupid retainer, which I'm starting to hate, despite saying I didn't in previous videos. <laughs> so there's a little bugger. It's cute, isn't it? Look at the poor little EL84s. What do they do to deserve such a shit life? Shame on you, Fender. Look at the bloody logos, would you? Just turn to back to their elemental particles. Just like this camera will if it doesn't start focusing on time. It's nice to see Fender use the uh, cable gland meant for a 3mm panel, not a 1.6. They're available in two panel thicknesses. So the 1.6 is meant for steel chassis, so it doesn't have any play like that. And this one's meant for aluminium chassis, which are generally thicker, around the two point something to three mil. Right, so we've got it in a position where we can sort of reach everything now. Uh, got access to the bottom of the board, so we can inspect that for any dry solder connections, as well as do our upgrades. It was easier to just remove the switch than disconnect it. So I can just swing it up out of the way. I've removed the speaker jack from the rear panel so I don't risk nicking those cables with the drill bit as I drill a hole for the line out socket. Uh, there's probably people screaming saying, you can just pull the tap for the line out off the speaker sec the speaker output, the transformer secondary. You can do that, but then you need a load plugged into the speaker outlet at all times. Whereas this way, he just wants the preamp so he can uh, leave the speaker plugged in. We'll take the input to the phase inverter to ground so the output stage is still functioning it's still dissipating energy but it's not receiving any signal so uh, you can just pull the signal from the line out and the speaker just sits there humming as much as this thing does in the background All right, so let's just uh, put a guide for the new hole 
go about halfway between the screws and that jack, which is 88 miles an hour, so 44. Set a punch, and we'll get the drill. So we used a uh, just three mil twist drill to uh, start her off. Because the tip of the step drill seems to get really worn really quickly, this isn't the most expensive one going around, but um, that's oh, that's actually the metric one. I'll get the Imperial. But, uh, but yeah, the, the first drill seems to really cop it, and then the rest of them can sort of uh, handle it pretty well. So you're sitting there forever on the first drill. I like to just drill with a twist drill. Higher quality steel, it seems to be. And um, you just don't destroy the tip of that too quickly. All right, so here's the Imperial step drill. We're going for a 3 8 hole. It gives it a little uh, bevel there as well. When it hits the next step, we'll go in and deburr the inside. All right, inside deburred. I'll uh, give that a vacuum, a bit of a blast with compressed air, and then we'll uh, grab a jack and figure out where we're going to tap into. So for the output jack, there are two ways we could go. We could use a run-of-the-mill stereo jack and just assume that he's going to use a tip sleeve plug and feed into a single-ended uh, input preamp, whatever he's doing, into another amp. But he might be using speaker simulator plug-ins and he might plug in a tip ring sleeve. So in which case, that would not ground the phase inverter input like we want to. It would be feeding the input of phase inverter with the input of a mic preamp which could do all sorts of weird shit so that would work if it's used properly uh, and let's not trust guitarists to use anything properly <laughs> so the better option is one of these jacks and it's a bit pricier but you're talking 18 bucks or 13, 15 bucks instead of five bucks so you know another 10 bucks whatever um, this one has an insulated switch so when the jack tip hits that, it closes that contact and you can do whatever you want with those contacts. So in this case, we're going to have one that's ground and one that's the phase inverter input. So when there's nothing plugged in, the phase inverter input will be past that capacitor, uh, will be working as normal. And when you plug in a jack, it will take that to ground. So it will cut off all input to the output stage. And then the tip will just be our line out like we drew on that schematic. All right, so we'll do a bit of uh, soldering Kung Fu here. We'll just tap straight into the valve socket without melting anything. will be nice. About that roughly where we're going, and we're going to pass that actually into the hole. And we've got a proper connection that's not a tack solder joint. Happy days. So that's our uh, grid of the input of the phase inverter. So we'll take that to the shorting, well, the switch. We'll just route that down across the bottom of the chassis out of the way. All right, now we're going to go snippity doo -dah. My favorite part of every job on a fender. Goodbye, shitty caps. I'll change out the plate loads on V1. So R10 and R3. R10 and R3. Because they like to get crackly and noisy, the shitty carbon film they use. Possibly do the same to the phase inverter. I'll just get rid of these caps so I've got a bit of room to move. Oh, that was bad. Mm, that's not as easy as I thought it would be. Gotcha. Not so tough now, are you? 47. 47 oof, which is glued in like fuck. Yep. See you later. All right, now we've got some more room to move. We can get to the screen grid resistors, which are RR25 and RR24. 25 and 24. Double check that. Uh, 24 and 24, which are currently half watt. Good on you. Half watt carbon film for screen grid resistors. I think I need some longer nose pliers. All right, they're gone. Next, we'll look at the bias divider. All right, so here's our bias divider. We've got, uh, it can, it's comprised of R29 and R30, R29, 15K to ground, R30 in series with the supply to the uh, junction of the bias feed resistors, 220Ks. 
Uh, so let's play with this divider value. So at the moment, anything will help, but we might bring that up to say, say 22K. Let's see where that lands us. I really should have probably tested that before I took this thing apart by paralleling something um, with that one, but uh, I kind of like to lift the value of this one instead of putting more load on the vice supply because it could sag because it's only capacitively coupled off the AC high voltage winding. So there's not a lot of current there. Uh, so let's, oh, it's got a, it's got a uh, resistor to ground there too. Let's lift that to say, say 22K and see where that puts us. We don't want to go too far or the plate voltage will go through the roof. So we'll lift that to 22K and see where that lands us. I already said that. Huh, that's interesting. R29 in the actual device is 18K. So I think they've realized it's already too hot and they've had to lift it, um, but they haven't gone far enough. Oh, why do I get hiccups as soon as I press record? Fuck's sake. So, since they've gone from 15 to 18, and we're still at 120%, let's... Let's go to... I don't know, 24 or 27. Let's go 24... Uh, let's go to 27. Yeah, we've got 33k on the top. Yeah, let's see where that lands us. We'll go 27k and see where we end up. All right, champions, so everything's back together. Uh, we're going to give it a quick test. Let's let the smoke out, eh? 47 watts, 43, dropping. That's good, and we've got signal. Pot didn't clean up, so... Really needs replacement, and it's a shitty pot to replace. Probably have to order one from the States. Turn it slowly and it's alright. But more importantly, the bias has come down quite a bit. That's the drop across the output uh, transformer primary. So we'll do some calculations and figure out where we're sitting now. Alright, so uh, we'll just measure the plate to ground. 350. So we've only gone up 10 volts, so that's not too bad. I was worried it was going to go up 360, 370 or something because of the pissy little power transformer. Uh, but that's acceptable ish. Um, it's about as good as we're going to get without serious uh, modification so let's figure out the bias so say 2.4 2.4 volts per side on average let's say 2.5 AB on the safe side divided by 98 ohms it's about the same each side equals 26 milliamps so multiply that by 350 volts 8.929 watt divided by 12. Sitting at 75 watts. Bang! I'm happy with that. That's as, probably as far as I want to go. Um, I'd like to get it down to 60, but then the plate voltage is going to go even further. So I think that's a nice little compromise between the two. So everything is working. Let's check the line out. First, we'll check that it just cuts off at all. Yep. Beauty. So no signal to the output there, regardless of the volume position. No bleed either, which is nice. So let's have a look at it. Oh, I'll have a look at it on the scope. You guys can't see the scope. But just trust me on this one, which is... All right, so line out test. We've got that going in a little MG10 bench amp there on the clean volume channel at about 12 o'clock. And we've got the strat going straight in. So nothing's coming out of the speaker output here, but the speaker's still plugged in. It's coming out of the line output here, driven by the cathode of... V1A. Yes, I think that's right. <laughs> Still got the crackliness there from the volume. Crank her all the way up, tone about halfway. What's that from? <laughs> just a preamp now. I was a bit skeptical as to its usefulness, but that could come in handy. 
Talk about the most impractical uh, distortion device, but known to man. <laughs> but then you unplug, and then bang. She's coming through the speaker. Yeah, so the comparison between the MG10 solid state tutor and the uh, the uh, Pro Junior's output stage, there's a lot more bass for the MG10. The bottom end of this thing's limited by just the physical small core sizes of the output transformer because the thing's tiny. It's almost the size of a single-ended little little tutor, but it's it's uh, going to severely limit the bottom end. But that's not a bad thing in this cab because it's only a tiny speaker and a tiny cab. So if you overload it with bass, it's going to get real flubby real quick. It's just energy that's got nowhere to propagate to. So. Really, it's best of both worlds. You can get the full range distortion. You can use this as a booster, probably, to drive something like a Marshall head um, a bit harder. It's just a good little toy to play with, really. And now it's got an extra output. And, um, yeah, I think we've hit the goal with this one. There's still a bit of hum there through the, uh, through the phase inverter. So I'll check that everything's fine and balanced there. It might, have been, might be our lead dress needs a little bit of refining. But um, yeah, we're 99% of the way there, so I'll leave it here, champions. Uh, this one was a bit of a play around one, a bit of fun. I probably shouldn't have spent so much time on it, but um, it was for my own curiosity as well. Uh, so yeah, now you can say you've seen a video of someone putting a active line out on a Pro Junior. I dare say no one else on YouTube's stupid enough to do that. So I'm always happy to oblige. See you on the next one, champions. <laughs>